Okay, so uh, well, uh, please, you know, you have the the speaker can uh, see you, so maybe just uh, please sit sit down down. Okay, go down and sit down for the speaker to uh, to see you better. And now, okay, I will spend like two minutes to introduce Kilian. Mm. So Kilian uh, Rachel has a position director de recherche at CNRS, Institut Denis Poisson, Université de Tours, and a, a position uh, of a professor at Université d'Orléans. And this position director de recherche is a very prestigious, uh, purely research uh, position in France. Uh, the scientific interests of Kilian Rachel um, are related to the intersection of probability combinatorics and uh, analysis. Uh, he is uh, mostly focused on random processes in cones in ZD, or rather you may say uh, wedges in uh, ZD, that is uh, harmonic functions, ma Martin boundary, random walks, uh, exit times for cones. And also he's interested in dimer models in statistical mechanics. This is in relation to Ising model and uh, in stochastic models for population dynamics. But uh, the, the common feature is uh, uh, complicated combinatorics uh, behind. In 2018, Kilian obtained a European Research Council grant awarded to people, to researchers um, who are um, less than uh, seven years after PhD. So to quite young researchers. And this is, I may say that this is the most prestigious competition for young researchers in Europe. He is an author of 40 papers, uh, most of them in top journals in probability combinatorics and uh, analysis. The list of his collaborators comprises uh, 36 names. He is also an associate editor for Annals of Combinatorics and Markov Processes and uh, Related Fields. And finally, in private, he is a, a nice, modest person engaged in building a mathematical community. Okay, so uh, Kilian, you are welcome. The floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for these very kind words, uh, Eva. It's uh, very nice. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and a honor, uh, I have to say. So today I will speak about um, some work in, in probability and combinatorics. And the title is uh, about enumeration or how to count uh, some model of walks in, in codes. Uh, what I like in this topic is that, uh, as you will see, I hope, it's at the intersection of uh, various mathematical fields. And so today I, I try to, uh, to split my talk into uh, six 15-minute uh, uh, parts. So the first one will be uh, just an introduction to the topic. And then I will have uh, five uh, different parts and each of them will be related to one uh, possible approach to this problem. So what I hope is that uh, you will be able to identify different ways and different ideas uh, to look at this problem. And uh, also these parts will be uh, somehow independent. Okay, so now I start by uh, introducing the, the topic. So I'm going to, to count, to enumerate some uh, objects. And so I need to define one domain. So the domain will be the set uh, where I'm looking to, uh, to count uh, this uh, object. So for me, it will be a cone, um, but a priori it could be in fact any kind of domain uh, in ZD. So ZD is the lattice. Um, and as a second step, we need to define how, so we're going to have some particle, so how the particle will move. So it's a bit like in the chess game. So if we have, uh, I know, the, the king, so we know how it moves uh, on the chessboard. And so here uh, we have to define the step sets, which exactly describes how the particle will move. Uh, so maybe you can take a look uh, on, the, on the right. So on the right, I, I took the, the quarter plane in dimension two. So for me today, it would be the most important code. And uh, I define the simple walk. 
by definition, it can move to, to the four neighbors, so top, down, right, and left. Um, and in this case, in the case of the part of plane, this is one possible example for my, uh, my move. So for the king walk, uh, to, we would have an eight, so to the eight neighbors, and not only to the four. And the once we have uh, this cone and this step sets, now we want to enumerate uh, some walks. And so what is a walk? For me, it will be a succession of points. Uh, so let's say P0 to, to Pn. And uh, what is important is that each of these points uh, belong uh, to the cone. So again, please take a look on, on the right. So you can see that each point belongs to the quarter plane. So there are no points outside of the domain. And also what is important is that the moves, so by definition, a move is a, a difference pi plus one minus pi uh, belongs to the step set S. So this is a very general framework. We have a cone, we have a step set, and we, we have some, some walks, and we want to count to enumerate uh, them. Um, and so here we, we can take a look uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so I wanted to introduce a number of walks. So we want to compute how many uh, paths uh, there are between two given points. So let's say P will be the starting point, Q will be the ending point. Uh, we can move according to N uh, different steps. We want to stay in the cone and we have fixed uh, a set of moves uh, S. So this will be my, my main uh, definition, my main topic. And uh, so now I, I wanted to present a bit the typical questions that uh, we'll be interested in. So I, I have identified uh, four different questions. The first one is uh, maybe the simplest one. So we have uh, some number and combinatorics, and we want to give a formula to compute uh, these numbers. So what do I mean by, by compute? So you know, in combinatorics, we have a kind of classical numbers, such as, as uh, the factorial number, so n factorials, we also have a binomial coefficient, uh, so nk. And uh, something we could try to do is to compute uh, the above numbers in terms of these classical numbers in, in combinatorics. Um, but maybe you can imagine that this is a bit too demanding because uh, it is so general a priori, so we have any cone in any dimension. So maybe it will be a bit too complicated, but still this is one of the objectives uh, to, to compute uh, these numbers. And uh, something which is equivalent uh, is to compute uh, the generating function. So for me, uh, generating function will be a key tool, and I'm going to introduce this to, to introduce it a bit later. So Q, Q1 and Q2, the two first questions, are just about saying something explicit uh, for the numbers. And uh, we have two further questions, uh, which are a bit less implicit, uh, a bit more implicit, sorry. And uh, here, I want to say something, for example, asymptotics. So imagine we take a very long walk, so n is very large. And the question is, can we approximate uh, this number of walks when n, n goes to infinity? And uh, another thing uh, could be to, to try to say something about the complexity um, of the numbers or of the function. And this, again, I'm going to define a bit later how we can measure, we can give a sense uh, to, to the complexity of, um, for example, a generating uh, function. So in all my talk, I will try to, to have these four questions in mind and to explain for each of my approaches, which one gives a nice uh, answer and to, to which questions. And uh, so now I, I wanted to explain a bit why uh, we want to count uh, walks in codes. And so in, in one sentence, and then I'm going to to make it a bit more precise. I would say that this is for, um, because walks in cones, there are correspondence with many other uh, objects. So many other objects in combinatorics. And imagine we have a, a bijection between some model of walking cone and another kind of uh, discrete mathemat mathematical objects. So of course we can use it to say something about the new object. So if we are able to, to study walks in cones, we will be able to say many things on many other kind of models. And um, uh, here I wanted to take a few examples. In fact, in the literature, there are much more. But still, these ones, I guess, are, are interesting. 
Um, so the first class of examples is given by, by some tableau, sometimes called the Jung tableau, um, which by definition, it's a kind of collection of boxes. And uh, we have a, a policy a way to fill in all the boxes. So what, what you can see uh, on the picture is that we, uh, the numbers are increasing from left to right and also from top to bottom, okay? And the, a typical question, this has a relation, for example, with the algebra, the presentation theory, is to enumerate uh, this kind of Jung table. And uh, in particular, we have uh, interesting questions about the limit shape of typical Jung tableau um, when the size of the tableau goes to infinity. And so for these models, we have a very strong uh, correspondence so between it and the, some works in uh, Another topic, maybe a bit more probabilist, is some, uh, the study of some queues, so queuing networks or queuing systems. And uh, here, so we have customers uh, which arrive, and uh, we also have some uh, servers, and typical questions are to compute um, how, what is the time they will spend in the system, how fast they are going to be served, uh, etc. And again, I'm going to speak a bit later about the correspondence between this model and uh, certain questions about works in um, I also wanted to briefly speak about permutations. So permutations are so important in, in combinatorics and everywhere in mathematics. And again, for some questions about permutations, uh, we can transfer this to some concrete um, questions observable on the uh, works in code. And the uh, last family of example is given by some uh, maps, uh, so here on the sphere. And again, we have some questions about how, how many, uh, is it possible to, to count uh, this number of maps. And again, we can use some correspondences between this model and, and works in code. So I, I could have continued the list, but the only idea is that, so this is useful because we are going to transfer, we could transfer all the results I will present on other models uh, in combinatorics. Okay, uh, so now I wanted to speak a bit about uh, one key tool which will be given by uh, the generating uh, function. So first, I wanted to take a, a simple example before uh, to elaborate. Uh, so a bit before I, I spoke about uh, uh, the factorial numbers, the binomial coefficients, and we also have another uh, number which is well known in combinatorics, which is called uh, the Catalan uh, number. So by definition, this is a, a simple binomial coefficient, so 2nn, and then we divide by, by n plus 1. And uh, so this is a, a rather simple number, but we have infinitely many numbers because we have, of course, infinitely many values of, of n. And so sometimes it's a bit more convenient to look not at all these numbers, but at the function, which is the sum of all the numbers, cn uh, multiplied by x uh, to the n. So instead of having uh, n, now we have one continuous variable uh, x. And uh, in this case, but of course it's not always the case, we can even compute and simplify the function. And we find that uh, uh, the series is in fact a simple uh, algebraic uh, series with some square root function inside. Um, so of course there are very strong links between uh, the numbers and, uh, and the function. So yeah, sometimes it's a bit more convenient to look at one or one of the other one of, of the two objects. So maybe you also know, uh, yeah, I can speak about this uh, briefly. You, you also know, of course, the Fibonacci numbers, so which are characterized by uh, F0 uh, to be one, F1 uh, to be one. And then we have a recurrence relation, uh, Fn plus two is equal to Fn plus one um, plus Fn. And uh, again, if you take uh, the generating function of, of these numbers, so we have the sum of Fn uh, Xn, and then you know that uh, this is equal to, to this series. So, I mean, I, I know what is your opinion, but uh, according to what you, are, you want to prove about these numbers, it could be more convenient to look at the recurrence relation or at the, at the series. Anyway, so this is uh, something that I guess you, you all know about how to, to define uh, a generating function. 
And um, now that we have uh, this, something we're going to, to do, and it has to do with the complexity I uh, mentioned a bit earlier. So how to characterize the complexity of a function. So this is what I'm going to introduce now. So imagine you have any kind of a function. It can be uh, the one associated to Fibonacci number or, or to the Catalan numbers. And the question is how, how complex is this function? Uh, and here I have defined a few classes uh, of functions. And uh, we want to put typically any, any function in one of these uh, classes of functions. So the simplest class is given by the set of uh, rational functions. Uh, so here. Uh, so by definition, this is a, a ratio of two polynomials. So one function is rational if and only if we can write it as a ratio of two polynomials. So it's difficult to be to be simple. And um, so maybe I can scroll a bit here and, and, and show that for Fibonacci numbers, we have a, a rational function, right? Just because this is the inverse of some polynomial. But of course, it's not sufficient to describe all the sets uh, of functions. And so we go a bit further and we introduce uh, algebraic functions. By definition here, um, this will be the set of functions which satisfy a polynomial equation. So the series for Catalan numbers is algebraic because there are some square roots and so we can find some polynomials. But now if, if, you, if you think at simple functions like uh, exponential functions or cosine, in fact, it is not algebraic, of course. We cannot find a polynomial which uh, is, is going to cancel uh, the exponential function. So we, we will introduce a, a bigger class of functions given by a definite or differentially finite functions. And uh, here the definition is to satisfy a linear differential equation with polynomial coefficients. So typically the exponential functions and of course many other uh, functions. Um, and now uh, a last a nice class of functions is given by the set of uh, differentially algebraic functions. So here, it's again related to uh, differential equations, but now we, it's okay to have a term which is nonlinear. So imagine you have an equation of the form, um, so y prime prime plus y, and then you have a term like two y cube. So this term is nonlinear, but still the function is uh, satisfies a, near, uh, a differential equation. And we say that the function is differential algebraic. And uh, once we have all these classes of functions, of course, there are still many, many uh, functions left. And these functions, so we, which do not satisfy any differential equations, are called the hyper transformable. So maybe you know, and I will speak about this uh, later, that the gamma function of uh, Euler, so which by definition is this, I guess you all know this function. So this function can be proved uh, to be a hyper transformable. So, so that doesn't exist any kind of differential equation which uh, this function satisfies. But, uh, and in fact, many, many functions have this property. Um, I don't know, for example, the Riemann uh, zeta function as well. Okay, so I think it, it is the end of my introduction. So you know we have some problem in combinatorics. We can define a series, a generating function, and then we we want somehow to, to understand the series and to say how complex uh, it is by putting it in some of these boxes of these classes of uh, functions. And uh, now I can move to the first part, which will be to, to give a, a way, maybe the simplest of all my approaches today, um, to attack uh, this problem of, of counting uh, works in, in groups. So in fact, I'm going to restrict to the, to the part of plane because this is uh, the, the simplest code and already it's uh, rather difficult. And so this technique will be mostly combinatorial and it is called the, the kernel method. Um, so the first point is how to define the generating function for, for some model. So here I have a few more parameters because you see we have the, the length of the path. So this is n. We have, uh, let's say, the points, the coordinates of the points where the, where the path terminates. So this is i and j. And so we have the three parameters, n, i, and j. And so to define uh, the generating function, we need to, to introduce three variables, x, y, and t. And uh, here, so in this way, we have the function, which is written here. 
and so we have a, a good generating function. So this, this object is uh, well defined. And um, so the, the first very important thing, which will be in fact common to all my approaches, is to state uh, some equation on this function q. So how to how to state a kind of equation? Excuse me, Kilian. Yeah, yeah, what sure. is the coefficient in this uh, function q or green q? What okay. is the coefficient in front of the monomial? Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, so this is exactly the, the numbers I'm going to be interested in today. So these numbers here. So by definition, uh, these are the numbers uh, which are introduced uh, here. So this is the number of walks. So here I have the starting point. So P on the left is the starting point. Q is the ending point. And then we have N steps and we, we stay in the code. So if we apply this to the quarter plane, um, yeah, so it's, it's here. Uh, so here, the zero, zero will be the starting point. Okay, so this is the origin of the, of the quarter plane. Then we have a path which uh, terminates to ij, so which is any point inside of the quarter plane. And um, the n here is to say that we take a path which is of length n, okay? So all what I want to, to do today is to compute uh, these numbers. And uh, as I could explain a bit earlier, it is equivalent to compute the numbers or to compute uh, the series. So this is why I, I, I choose to, to focus, on, to focus on, on Q. Is it a bit clearer? OK, so, so thank so, you very much. So we have this uh, function Q. And now I, we want to, to say to, to state some equation on, on this function. And so what is nice is that, so in fact, it will follow from a, a very intuitive uh, uh, understanding of, of my model. So this is uh, the, the set of pictures which you, you can see a bit. So I, I want to explain a bit that a, a walk is typically a recursive object. And from this, we can deduce an equation on the function Q. So please uh, take a look at the a picture on the left. So this one here. So here, uh, I just say, I want to count some walk. But so what is a walk? So by definition, there are two possibilities. Either the walk is empty. I mean, so just we, we didn't move. And this is uh, what you, you can say, uh, you can see, sorry, uh, here. So this is an empty walk. I mean, we just stayed at the origin. And the, if the walk is not empty, it means that this is this was already a walk, and because it is not empty, we could add one further step at the end. So this is what I have represented here. We have a walk, and after the walk, we just added one possible step. Uh, so here I chose to, to focus on the a simple walk I and mean, to, to these four neighbors, but of course it, it works for any kind of, of model. Um, the only problem is that if you write such an equation, we have forgotten uh, some key points, which is that we want to count walks which stay in the quarter plane. So imagine now if you look at this path, we have a walk and the walk ends on the vertical or horizontal axis. And then of course we can use one step to make the, the walk out of the quarter plane. And this, we don't want to count these walks because we just want to, to count the walks which stay, which are confined to the quarter plane. And so this is why we say, okay, we have to subtract all of these models. And this is why uh, here we have a minus sign. And the same here, we have a minus sign because we want to subtract the walk which go out from the quarter plane from, from this vertical axis. So, just by using this kind of very intuitive um, understanding of, of walks, we can write an equation on the function Q. So this is what I do now. So this is the same, the same slide. But now, to each of my small pictures, I have written um, a series to which it corresponds. So on the left, for example, there is this term Q because we just want to count all series. The term one here corresponds to the empty, empty walk. 
And then again, to, you can continue and associate to each of the terms one a particular series. So I know the, the third term, so this one here. So we said, okay, this is a walk, and then we added one jump. So it's exactly what is written here because this is a walk, so this is Q. And because we add one jump, we have somehow to multiply by uh, the, all the possibilities. So X is for uh, the direction right, uh, one over X is for the direction uh, left and, and, and so on. And also because we, we have to subtract uh, some terms, then we say that uh, so there are some terms in, in red which should disappear. And uh, yeah, maybe a, a last point. So what is this Q of X uh, zero? So Q of X zero T uh, say that Y is equal to zero. So it means that we just count walks which terminate on the horizontal axis. And uh, yeah, after some elementary manipulations, um, we, we get one equation, uh, the one in, in, in yellow, which is the main equation uh, that I'm going to study today. So now somehow you can even forget about uh, the combinatorics and just have in mind that I'm going to present techniques and the ideas on how to solve uh, this equation. So this equation is a bit surprising because in fact we have so one equation and also one unknown. So a priori we could say, okay, this is easy. We can just, just solve it uh, directly. But of course the main problem is that, uh, okay, we have just one unknown but it is evaluated at different points. Um, so you can see on the left, it is evaluated at uh, X and Y here, X, Y, T. And here we have X uh, zero, and here zero and Y. So because we, we have just one function, but we evaluate it at uh, different points, the problem is quite complicated. And this is called a kernel functional equation because there is a term here, which is in front of the equation of the left hand side. And this term sometimes is called a kernel. So yeah, so we're going to see this equation many times. Uh, so don't worry if uh, it was not that easy to, to get it, but still uh, not complicated because it just follows from this uh, recursive uh, understanding of, of roots. Okay, so, so now you, you can see again the equation, exactly the same. And I want to solve uh, this equation. So one key uh, idea is to make use, to take advantage of the symmetries of this kernel. So this term in front of the equation is the most important term here. And um, I think it, it's rather easy to observe that if you change X in a, a one over X, in fact, this part of the equation, which stays the same, right? I mean, this is just a, an easy observation. And of course, the same in, in Y gives a one over Y. Uh, so you can do some manipulations and you see that in the kernel, at least, you have uh, exactly the same equation. Okay, so we can just make use of this um, observation. And now, instead of one equation we can use, we can obtain uh, different equations which uh, will be obtained from the first one, but replacing x, for example, by one over x and y by one over y. So now I just have written exactly the same equation, but each of them corresponds to one particular pair. So x, y, x, one over y, one over x, one over y, and uh, y, by one over x. So just the same equation evaluated at different points. Um, okay, so, so somehow it's simple because all of this comes from just one equation. But now the question is, what can we do with it? And uh, so one possible answer is to, to take a sum. So not exactly a sum, but uh, some alternating sum. So it's why I have put some signs of plus or minus in front of uh, all the unknowns. And we are going to sum up all uh, these equations. And why is it interesting to, to do so? Uh, so you can just look at the equations. And uh, you see that in fact, many terms 
uh, will vanish. So for example, this one here, uh, this is QX zero uh, T, it will disappear with this one, just because we took, a, a, we have taken different sides. And again, I, I don't know if I look at uh, this one here, it will vanish uh, with this one. And in fact, all the terms on the right uh, just will disappear because we, we have chosen the, the good signs uh, when we, we sum up the equation. So of course, everything is based on very strong symmetries on, on, on the equation. And so the conclusion, and we are almost done with this approach, the conclusion here um, is the following. So now I take the alternative sum of all my four complicated equations and uh, on the right, everything, almost everything vanishes except uh, the simple terms, which are totally explicit. So we are happy because all the complicated functions like Q of X zero T just is happy. Um, but of course, the, the price to pay is that now on the left, uh, we have four times um, a function. And so we have a last uh, effort to do here to understand how we can just remove uh, all the terms because what we want is to compute the series Q. So we want to compute this series here and somehow to remove everything here. So to, to do this, so what we can uh, observe is that because we're in the quarter plane, if you look at the series, so maybe I should uh, show the series again. Uh, if you look at the series here, um, all terms of the form X, X, A, I, Y, J, in fact, uh, have positive I and J or let's say non-negative I and J, just because we're in the quarter plane. So if we choose a positive quarter plane, all coordinates are positive. And now, uh, if you look at this equation here, I don't know, I can speak about this term here. Now we take a one over Y. So it means that now, if, if you look at all the terms of the form X, I, Y, J, because now we have a one over Y, all the, the J here will be negative. Non positive. And so the series is very well uh, structured somehow. And if you just restrict to the terms uh, which have positive i and j, we can extract uh, the function q. So this is what I, I wrote here. So the conclusion of all this uh, combinatorial techniques, so the kernel method, is that we can uh, express x, y, q, so the main series, as a totally explicit. Uh, function. So here we have uh, the ratio of, of two, two simple polynomials in x, y, and t. And the only difficulty is that we have to take just the positive uh, terms. I mean, the ones which are associated to positive i and j. Okay, so let, let me give the conclusion of this uh, approach. Um, so I would say that this approach is, is nice because in fact, it is so simple. We have one equation, which is nature and for the problem. And then we can make kind of combinatorial manipulations. And at the end, just using the symmetries of the model, we get uh, an explicit solution. Maybe something which is positive is that uh, we can answer all questions, which is, this is, this is totally explicit. You can say something asymptotics when n goes to infinity. And also we can say something about the complexity because uh, here we have a kind of rational function and it's not that difficult to say something about uh, the complexity, even if uh, we look at the positive evaluation point. So maybe the, the biggest problem here is that we had to assume that the, the group of symmetries is finite. So you know this is this X gives one over X, Y gives one over Y and this, if you think of it, this is a very, very strong condition. If you take a random model, it will never have this property. So this technique is nice, but it works only on a very, very small uh, set of models. And also what is not clear is how to make it work if we have, imagine a walk, but with big jumps, a bit like a, a queen in chess, and we can move to, uh, according to bigger jumps. 
and also what happens in higher dimension. So this is also the plane. Okay, so it was the end of my um, uh, first approach. And before taking a, a break, I wanted to speak about a second possible uh, technique, this time related to complex uh, analysis. Um, so again, the, the aim is exactly the same. We have a functional equation and we want to, 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 to find some techniques, some ideas to solve it. And here, I wanted to, to mention a long tradition in the probabilistic literature um, in which some colleagues proved a very strong correspondence between walks in the quarter plane, say in quotes, and a, a very particular problem in, in analysis called a binary value problem. So in, in a minute, I will explain what is for me a, a binary value problem. Um, but yeah, before I, I just wanted to, to show that already in the 70s, some, some colleagues um, invented this kind of approaches. And so this is a very first. So this was for probability, but maybe most of the applications at that time were to, um, for queuing uh, networks. So a priori, this relation is a bit surprising because of course there is no obvious relation between these two things. So what is for me a boundary value problem? Of course, I'm just looking at the very uh, subclass of all boundary value problems. So for me, it's the following. We take uh, the complex plane, so C, and uh, we take a curve, which I call the L in the complex plane. And uh, what I want is to find a function f, which will satisfy some condition on the curve. But more precisely, imagine we, we are given two functions, a and b. So we know a and b on the curve. And uh, we want to find a function f, which is analytic or mesomorphic on c, but maybe not on the curve l. And so what is important is to look at this uh, binary condition. So this one here. Uh, so this is to say that the limit uh, from above, so imagine we have a point uh, on the curve, so like here, and we take the limit from above and uh, minus a, which is known times the limit uh, from below. And we want this to be equal to some function b of x. So of course, if the function f were analytic on, on the complex plane, uh, the limit from, from above and from below would be the same, right? But because a priori here, the function is not analytic around the curve L, uh, the, the two quantities are not the same. So yeah, for me, this will be uh, the kind of Bundara value problem I will be looking at. And uh, what is nice is that in fact, we can solve this uh, in an explicit way using uh, formulas by a, a, a Polish uh, researcher, so Sokotsky, I hope uh, I pronounce it uh, in a somehow nice way. Uh, and so these formulas will give uh, at least a formula for F. And so we can solve this kind of binary value problem. This is a solvable uh, problem. Yeah. Okay, so now I, I want to explain in the rest of this uh, second part, how we can use this and, and how these binary value problems appear uh, in relation with, with my combinatorial problem. Okay, so how we have uh, the functional equation, the same as in the previous part. So if, if you just forgot it, you can take a look. It's again a written. So how we, we can obtain from it uh, a boundary value problem. You can also just try to, to solve it uh, by your own. Um, so the first step is to take um, the variables X and Y related. So a priori in, in the previous part, in the combinatorial part, X and Y were totally uh, free variables, I mean, independent variables. And now we say, okay, we, we want X and Y to be related by K equals zero. So what is the advantage of, uh, of doing so? Of course, if the kernel is equal to zero, it will mean that uh, all the term uh, on the left here will be equal to zero, right? I mean, because this is a definition of the kernel. 
So we have a strong advantage if we do so because already one part of the equation uh, has a simplification into the conclusion. And so you see uh, here, I have just uh, rewritten the equation if and now we say that the canal is equal to zero. So now the equation is so simple. I mean, we have one function of x here. Here, we have one function of purely on y. And if you take the sum, uh, so we get a simple term of the form x times y. So the equation is very simple. Of course, the price to pay is that now the variables x and y are related. But still, uh, it's a nice way to attack the problem to not to work um, with independent variables x and y, but to restrict to the set of, of uh, zeros. Okay, so this is the first step. Now, how to continue? Um, so we have a second step, which is again to, to, to observe a bit the symmetries of the kernel. Because again, in fact, I'm looking at a simple walk. I mean, you can see it because uh, here, this, is, this corresponds to the simple work. So maybe I, I should insist a bit more. If we take um, so the, the jump to the right, so this we are going to write it as x one, y zero, because of course going to the right, it is a jump of one and zero. Okay. So going to, to the right direction, it gives just a term of the form x. And this is the x you can see in this, uh, in this scale. And for example, the term one over y now will correspond to the um, down step just because it, it, will, it corresponds to, to zero values. So just this to say that in fact, I'm looking on this slide again at a simple uh, walk because it's a bit more uh, convenient. But anyway, so we have uh, the equation and now we say, okay, we have a nice symmetry in the step set because it has this uh, x, uh, one over x symmetry, just because you have a, uh, a jump to the right, we have a jump to the left, and the one over x symmetry says that if you take the reflection um, with respect to the vertical axis, the step sets will be the same. And of course, for the simple walk, it is the case. And so uh, this observation uh, allows us to write that if we have uh, this first equation, we can get exactly the same equation, but now x is replaced by a uh, one over x. So we just use this symmetry. And uh, maybe now you feel that uh, what is important in this topic is to take sometimes the differences of equations or subtraction of equations, uh, which I'm doing now. So if you take the equation for the, for the first step and you remove it uh, to the one of the second step, now, all the terms which depend on y just disappear because they correspond to the same value of y. And we have an equation purely on x. <clears throat> and so now you see we are getting closer to this uh, boundary value problem. But it's not, uh, not yet obvious how to get a boundary value. OK, so this is what I explained now. So above we obtained uh, this. Oops, excuse me. We obtain uh, this equation here, and uh, now I say, okay, but imagine we we restrict it to the unit circle. On the unit circle, um, we can rewrite one over x uh, as a conjugate, so the, the complex conjugation of, of x, and so we have a somehow equivalent way, which is now in, in green. Um, to write my, my boundary condition. Okay, so this, this remark was uh, simple. And now, now, so to say, we, we can interpret it as a boundary value problem. Of course, it's not exactly the same because, as I could say before, um, so we don't have a limit from above, limit from below, but in fact, it's almost equivalent. Um, and there is a way to transform this problem into a classical uh, boundary value problem. So let's say now that we are here, I, I, I will need like 10 minutes, which I will not do, but uh, to, to explain how we can exactly have a totally classical boundary value problem. And again, using this uh, 
Stokowski Clemens formula, we can solve uh, the equation. And so we can give a formula for the generating function of the groups, which is exactly what we want to do. And uh, so what is the shape of this explicit formula? So now we have a formula in terms of a contour integral. Uh, uh, Kilian, I, I, yeah, I yeah. don't understand. What is the relation between Q and F? Um, yes, yeah, so a priori F, uh, it's, it works for any kind of function uh, F. Okay, any function. So we, we, we had a curve. We are looking for a function F that satisfies this equation. And yeah. what have we done? I mean, I understood all the steps, but somehow I don't understand the Yeah, yeah, no, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Th th thank you for putting me. Um, yeah, so, so my point is that, so here we, we had this curve uh, L. So somehow we, we had this picture and we had uh, an L here. And what I wanted to say is that now for, for my equation, uh, we can imagine that we have the complex plane and what will replace this curve L will be in fact the unit circle. Um, and now we don't have a condition like limit from above, limit from below, but we have a condition X. So this is a point X here. And in here, this is the point X conjugate. So, I, okay, it's not exactly the same, but it's almost the same. Okay? It's a kind of boundary value problem because we have a, a boundary condition. And so we can using, you, we, we can use some conformal mapping to transform this one into this one. So once we have a, a condition of the form X, X bar, X conjugate, we have a kind of classical boundary value problem using some conformal mapping, okay? So yeah, it's not exactly the same, but it belongs to the same class, a big class of problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so to conclude uh, this part, uh, so what is nice in this approach and what is maybe a bit uh, less nice. Um, so the pos positive point is that we, we get something again explicit and because typically you are going to obtain an integral for uh, the function Q. And so we, it shows that uh, we solved uh, the problem. Of course, it's not clear how to compare exactly uh, this kind of expression to the one obtained in my first part uh, after this combinatorial manipulation. So this is a question how to, to prove that this, the two uh, equations in fact uh, coincide. But anyway, so we're happy with this because uh, we, we can solve this for many models. And in fact, even if we don't have symmetries. And this is uh, something interesting because in the first part, we needed this nice symmetry in the model. And now it works in a very uh, general setting. And so I wanted uh, in the last slide for, for this first part of the lecture to insist, so in, in just one minute, on two uh, technical aspects related to, to I will come to this. Again. What is also nice that it works if we have a weight. So imagine now we want to, to count uh, rooks, but for some reasons uh, we say, okay, if we use a north uh, jump, we want it to, to count twice. So it's a bit, if we have probability, transition probabilities, um, which are not all equal to a one divided by something. So I mean, a more general problem, or if we have more complicated boundary conditions, it's, it's also works. And we, we have the same limitations that uh, if you have very big gems or if you work in higher dimension, it's not at all clear what to do here because um, yeah, so you have seen we, it's based on complex analysis. <clears throat> I think complex analysis works in dimension two, and uh, it's, it becomes so complicated in, in higher dimension. And so to conclude this first part, I wanted to mention just two uh, small uh, technical aspects. Um, so what we have seen is that um, it was important to get, to take X and Y related by the kernel. So K of X from T is equal to zero. And here I wanted just to, to give a name to what it is. So what is the set of X and Y in the complex plane such that K is equal to zero? So in fact, if you look at the theory, it is just what we call a Riemann uh, surface. So, I mean, it has a name, it is very well studied. So we can use many, many tools and ideas from this uh, world to, to try to say something about uh, X and Y. 
And also what is nice that if you take um, small steps, I mean, so typically the, the simple walk, uh, then we have a, a genus of the Riemann surface, which is a zero or one. So we have a nice Riemann surface. And now if you have very big jumps, um, then of course it, it can become arbitrary uh, large. But still, so we have this connection here uh, between uh, all these uh, kernel functional equations and the so classical theory of Riemann surfaces. So there is something to do here. And um, so to answer your question, Eva, you, you said, what is the relation between this uh, um, boundary condition X, conjugate of X, and uh, the classical um, uh, setting of boundary value problem? And so maybe the answer is, is here. So something we, we have to do in the approach is to find some function f, so not the same function f as before, uh, which satisfies the following. So imagine we there is any kind of curve which is symmetric with respect to the horizontal axis. And the, the question is, find a function f uh, which will be invariant by x, x bar. So uh, here you, you can see uh, one example. If we take the unit circle, of course, we can take x plus one over x. Because again, the con conjugation x bar is one over x. And so this function here will be uh, clearly invariant by x x bar. But now, if you take any kind of Riemann surfaces, any kind of model, we will have uh, a compl complicated curve here. And again, one key tool in the approach is to be able to, to compute, to say something about such a function, um, which somehow glues x and the x. Okay, so let me finish for the first part and uh, I'm happy to welcome any question if you have or, or later. Thank you. Yeah, okay, okay, very good. Are there any questions? Any questions from online participants? Well, it seems it's not the case, so let's make a break. Okay, okay. thank you. So, so 15 minutes. We'll, uh, resume in 15 minutes. Uh, let's see. What time is it? Okay, let's resume at uh, quarter past 12. Okay, so we have resumed. So please uh, start gently. They will come. I mean, the people who are on site will come slowly. So start, please start gently. Okay, okay. I, I can also wait a, a couple of minutes if you prefer. Uh, well, okay, well, we may just wait for a moment. Yeah, okay. You know, it's not, not clear if, uh, well, they just uh, sat down a little bit further. So just don't worry okay. about okay, okay. them and uh, uh, please uh, continue. Okay, okay, so welcome back for, for the second part of the lecture. Um, so here now we have uh, three remaining uh, approaches. And uh, again, the, the aim is the same. So we have this um, combinatorial model of how to count rooks in the quarter plane. And the main question is uh, how to solve this problem, how to say something about uh, the generating function. And so I will start by um, an approach related to Galois theory of different equations. So here the aim is to, to look at the third question about the complexity of the generating uh, function. And to be a bit more precise, uh, the question is, do we have uh, an algebraic a differential relation uh, for the generating function? So I wanted to take a, a few examples. Um, so if you take one over cosine, in fact, it satisfies um, some differential equation. I mean, the one I, I showed a bit earlier in my talk. Um, and so this function is rather nice, but doesn't satisfy any uh, linear differential equation. Okay, so the, the cube has to be here. It's not possible to find a linear differential equation. And also we have this uh, gamma function of uh, Euler, and uh, for which we know that there is no differential equation at all. So this is a famous uh, theorem by uh, Euler. And um, so let's say this is a general picture. And of course, the question now is how to apply this to uh, my enumeration problems. And 
to give like a, a punchline. Um, so I know if you have in mind how we prove in, in practice that the gamma function of Euler is a hyper transcendental. And maybe something which is common to all or almost all approaches is that the gamma function satisfies the functional equation. You know, this is a, is a very basic one, uh, which says that uh, gamma of x plus one is equal to x uh, gamma of x. Um, so this is just obtained by uh, integrating by, by parts somehow. And, uh, and then the reasoning is as follows. So we assume that we have a differential equation and then using this relation, we can construct another uh, differential equation. And so typically, if you then take the subtraction of the two uh, differential equations, you can construct a new differential equation, which would be, so whatever it means, of smaller order. And so this is typically a contradiction in, in the reasoning. So this is rather easy to, to start from this functional equation to deduce something about um, the differential properties of the gamma function. And so for us, it will be exactly the same. We have uh, the functional equation, I mean, the, the one you already know now. And I will explain how to, to make use of it to deduce something about the different, uh, differential properties of the generating functions. Okay. So here, I wanted to mention a result which is a priori uh, totally unrelated to my, uh, my problem, but it's just an interesting result, which I'm going to apply uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes. So this is a, a theorem due to uh, Ishizaki, which says uh, the following. In fact, it's a bit similar to my uh, Vodnare value problem equation, if you have it still in mind. So we have uh, two rational functions, A and B. And now the difference that we have some parameters, some complex parameter Q, which is uh, say not equal to zero and not equal to one in, in modulus. And uh, uh, here's uh, the aim is to find a function F, which is a globally neuromorphic on, on C and which satisfies uh, a Q difference equation. So a Q difference equation is exactly what uh, you, you can uh, see here. So this is about my Q difference equation. So A and B again are known functions. So all the problem is to find if Q is also known. And the conclusion of this theorem is a very nice uh, dichotomy of behavior uh, for the function, for the solutions uh, to this equation. So what it says that either the function F is very simple, and in this case, it is a, a rational function, or it is very complicated and hypertransformable. But all the classes in between, like definite or differentially algebraic, uh, cannot be rich. So it, it's a, a pretty a bit surprising result. It's a, yeah, either a simple or a very complicated, but nothing in between. So I, I don't know what you, you want to do if, if you see such an equation. Maybe it's natural to think to iterate, right? I mean, so we have one equation and then we can uh, replace a S uh, by a QS and then get a new equation and, and continue. So have infinitely many equations. And if you do so, you also see that typically, if you assume that we have a pole, uh, I mean, a singularity for the function F, is if F is equal to infinity uh, at some point, uh, S zero, then in fact, we are going to have infinitely many poles just because of this Q orbit except we have um, uh, conciliations. But let's say the, the generic situation is that one pole gives infinity many poles. And of course, as you know, if you have a, a rational function, it cannot have uh, an infinite number of poles. So this is typically the kind of reasoning that uh, allows to, to discard as a case of a rational. Anyway, so we will use this result in a, a bit later in, in the talk. And now I come back to the very same, almost the very same equation, not exactly on the same model. So I'm no longer considering the simple walk. Now I'm looking at another one for, for some technical reasons. Uh, so now I look at this one, which has uh, three jumps. And uh, as now you understand that if, so this jump in the direction say one, one will give 
uh, this term here and the same for the two zone. So I guess now you understand how to, to, to define what is a good kernel once we have fixed the kernel. So this is the equation. And um, now there is something interesting about the parametrization of the kernel code. And so because I, I try to be uh, as pedagogical as, uh, as I can, uh, I wanted to introduce a, a simple example related to the unit circuit. So this is what you can see here. So imagine we have an, an implicit description of the unit circle, so the set of X and Y, such that X squared plus uh, Y squared is equal to one. Um, so of course, this is a simple and nice equation, but it is implicit because it's not a X as a function of Y or Y as a function of X. And what we call a parametrization, it's when you just have one variable and you express on the curve, the sets, as um, some coordinates, some explicit coordinates. Uh, so of course, for, for cosine and sine, uh, so for the unit circle, so we can just say that it's cos and, and, and sine. And uh, so we know that, that it works, but it's better because now we have just one variable, u, and not two variables, x and y. And um, also an important remark is that if you have one parametrization, in fact, you have infinitely many other parametrizations, and if, uh, for some reason, you prefer to use uh, rational functions, you can also uh, change uh, the point of view. And this is what I have written here. We can find also a rational parametrization of, this, of the unit circle of this form. I mean, this is a, an easy exercise to check that if you sum up the squares of these two terms, you get one. And maybe also a nice uh, property if you look again at this uh, rational parametrization of the unit circle, uh, which, which kind of manipulation is natural to do? So we can try to put S into a one over S. So I, and maybe you can suggest that so the first coordinate will be sent to minus the first coordinate, and the second one will be uh, unchanged. So somehow this transformation in S gives a property of the model of the unit circle that uh, it has an invariant property that uh, if you, you have some x, y, of course, minus x and y is also on the circle. Right? So, I mean, I say this to explain a bit later what uh, will be uh, arrived. Okay. And so, of course, in the case of the, of the unit surface is, is simple. But now imagine you want to do the same uh, from, from my kernel. In fact, it, what is uh, beautiful is that there are no more difficulties, actually. And um, so the results uh, can be read off on this slide. So if now you want to parameterize or to uniformize uh, the zero set of the kernel, we have a quite simple description of the coordinates a bit more complicated uh, in comparison with the unit circle, but not that complicated. The only difference is that now we have some uh, Q parameter. So Q is defined on the right as a function of T, but this is normal because, uh, so we have a T in the kernel, so it, it should be, it should appear on the, on the parametrization. And also a small remark is that we have uh, two uh, uh, involutions, two simple transformations, like uh, S gives a one over S, or S gives a Q over S, which uh, leave invariant uh, the curve. A bit, uh, like I said uh, above, for the unit circle. So finally, everything is very similar to the unit uh, circle. And explicit and uh, rational in, in, in S. So this is my, my first step. We have- Well, I, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, please. Go in ahead. the first, uh, in the very first part, you have uh, you you had just it was just R two yes and uh, a quadrant in R two I mean a cone in R two yes X yeah. and Y were just real numbers and here they are uh, complex numbers yes yes um, 
And uh, my question is about random walks, because at the beginning, the random walk was up, right, down, left, yes? And now okay. you... Yep. And now you and now you say that the, the random walk is different, but it's still on on uh, on Z two or. I excuse me. No, so what didn't change is that we're in the quarter plane. So for all the talk, for sure. Um, but yeah, I chose to to take a, a different uh, model because in fact, if you take the simple walk in this case, uh, you will not have uh, a rational parametrization for some technical reasons. So yeah, this one is a bit nicer from this uh, point of view. But for, for the first question about uh, uh, complex numbers or real numbers, so the point is that um, even if it's related, I mean, the, the set where the walk uh, evolves is indeed the R2 and it's uh, in the quarter plane, but it's not directly related to these variables X and Y, which a priori can be taken even as complex numbers. So I mean, okay, have... okay, okay. So I understand. You start with real, but then you just take variables. You, you yeah. obtain the function Q, and you may say that X, Y are complex numbers. Yeah, exactly. But so yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So so the first step was this parametrization, and now um, what we do, in fact, is the same as in the second part of my tour. We evaluate the functional equation at the root of the kernel. The only difference is that uh, in the second part of my talk, we didn't have any formulas for X and Y. We just said, okay, we take X and Y related together. And now we go further because we can say uh, X is equal to something as a function of S and Y is equal to something as a function of S. So just a matter of making things a bit more explicit. But this equation is not uh, mysterious. I mean, this is, just a functional equation evaluated at this uh, coordinates of the, of the uniformization. And again, I mean, again, the same uh, game uh, that now I, I hope you are a bit classical, uh, which is a bit classical for you, is to evaluate the equation at a related point and not now at x of s and y of s, but x of q over s and y of q over s. It's a bit the idea of playing with uh, all the invariant properties. And uh, so let's say this is a uh, one equation star. And so now I have equation star, but evaluated just at Q over S instead of S. Just a only, diff uh, only difference. And uh, again, the same idea is that now we take the difference of the two equations because we have uh, the observation that if you take the difference, one term will vanish. Uh, namely, this one here will cancel with this one here. And at the end, we have a single equation on a, a single function uh, f, and f is a function related to q, x, uh, and z. Yeah, so uh, sorry if I am a bit quick here, but uh, what you should keep in mind is that uh, if you have uh, this parametrization, which is finally just basic computations, um, then you can easily obtain an equation of this form. And uh, I mean, it's uh, rather obvious that this is almost a Q-difference equation in the sense of uh, Ishizaki uh, theorem, which I presented uh, earlier. So I, I just wanted to make sure that the, the connection was, was clear. So Ishizaki uh, theorem is this kind of equation, equations here. And what we just get is the one in yellow just above. So what is the difference? What are the differences? So A, in fact, is equal to 1. So we're, we're even in the subcase. Uh, B of S corresponds to this explicit uh, function. So why explicit? Because we know the coordinates of the uniformization. And all the problem is to find A of S. So uh, maybe, yeah, sorry. Can I have a question? Uh, so yeah, sure. Uh, this writing in yellow, it's uh, hardly visible. Ah, okay. Uh, ah, could you sorry. write it somewhere below, maybe in some other color? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so the equation we obtain at the end. Excuse me. Um, is this one. So we have f of s minus f of q over s is equal to uh, some coordinates of the uniformization. Okay, so and I just wanted to compare this equation, which we just obtained, 
with uh, Ishizaki, a classical equation. And so this is almost the same uh, after some easy complications uh, using invariance proof. And so now this is uh, the end of this part. So we know how to obtain uh, simple Ishizaki-like uh, equations. And so a priori, we can say something about um, the series to be rational or to be hypertransonant. And, uh, and the conclusion is, 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 uh, is the following. So a priori, if you take a generic model, in the small step case, it will always be a hypertransonant. So, I mean, in general, this problem, even if I know what is your opinion, but uh, maybe this problem is rather simple. You know, I mean, we have uh, just a part of plane, we have uh, a set of moves. So we could say that th this problem is classical and it's uh, rather easy to solve. But in fact, if you look at the series, you will get in almost all cases, a hypertransonantal series. So a very complicated series on which we cannot say much and uh, yeah, we're a bit blocked uh, with this uh, conclusion. But in fact, well, this is a negative size. Uh, yeah. Uh, but we also have uh, some nice exceptional cases for which, in fact, we have a differential equation. So I said generic models uh, will be hypertransonantal, but there are also non generic models I mean, uh, for some spe specializations which admit differential equations. And so I wanted to give some examples. So imagine we, we, you take uh, these two models here. Uh, which are exactly the same. So we take the simple walk, and in uh, one example, you take uh, a direction one, one, and on the right, you, you take the direction one minus one. So there, there is, of course, a reflection going from one model to the other. And uh, what is fun is that, in fact, the first one admits a differential equation, and the second one doesn't. So it is a hypertransformative. So even very small differences sometimes can lead to completely different conclusion at the, at the end. And this is kind of a, an open question to, to somehow understand if you give me um, a step set or a set of moves, will it be at the end a hypertransformative or, or not? And we, we don't have any kind of combinatorial interpretation for that. And again, the same limitations, what happens for a, a bigger jump so in higher dimension, so this we don't know, because of course all the tools, in particular this uh, uniformization, uh, are based on the dimension two on complex analysis, Riemann surfaces, and, uh, and so on. Okay, so now we are ready for the, the first part. So now the, the topic is a bit different because. Uh, my question is, how can we apply a probability of theory to deduce something about uh, our discrete uh, combinatorial model? So I, I wanted to start by a very, very classical uh, idea in, in discrete prob probability of theory. If you have any kind of discrete uh, structure, you, you might want to, to try to define an associated continuous uh, quantity, uh, which I call uh, a scaling limit and try to approximate any kind of um, discrete objects by uh, this continuous object. So for us, we will have a random walk at the beginning, and at the end, we're going to have a Brunel motion in, in certain points. And uh, the advantage, uh, if you do so, is that um, on the scaling limits, because this is a continuous object, you can do a classical analysis, and um, many uh, new tools uh, become available. Whereas I would say discrete complex analysis is much more, it is much harder in general. So this is a, yeah, it's a very general idea of, of this part. Try to define uh, a scaling limit and use results on this uh, scaling limit. So to be a bit more specific, um, so you, you can take a look on the left. So there is a cone in dimension two. There is a, a random walk, so you can see this is a discrete random walk because it has some, some jumps. And uh, yeah, so we have some equations. In particular, uh, I define a tau, which is the first time my walk, which uh, will uh, just exit the code. And so what I'm going to do in this part is to explain how we can define the continuous object. So now we have continuous paths, as you can see. 
Um, but in fact, still, we can define many analog quantities, like uh, the first time my continuous process, so my Brunel motion will go out of the clock. So we'll have a kind of a dictionary between discrete and continuous settings and see a bit uh, what we can do with uh, this. Okay, and, and now what is the starting point of using a probability uh, in this combinatorial problem? So, so you know maybe there's a simplest formula in, uh, in combinatorics uh, is to, or in probabilities to say, if you want to compute a, a probability, you will get it as a ratio of two quantities. So let's say in, in the numerator, you will have uh, the cardinal, the cardinality of all objects, I mean, which have the constraints. And in the denominator, you will have the total number of uh, objects. So and this is just how to compute the probability in, in, in a certain number of cases. And you can just apply it uh, here and say that um, how to compute a probability uh, that a walk, a random walk, uh, will go from some point X to, to some point Y in a certain number of steps and so on. It will be the, the ratio of two quantities. In the numerator, the good number of walks in the codes. And in the denominator, the total number of walks. And the total number of walks is just S uh, to the end here. Because S, I mean, this is the cardinality of the step, uh, step set S, uh, counts uh, how many jumps, how many, yeah, the number of walks of, uh, of steps we have in the step set. So, I mean, this very first formula just gives a, an interpretation of my number of walks as a probability in a quite uh, in a direct way. So, nothing complicated here. And the only part which, which will be complicated is how we can now approximate the probability for the random walk by a probability uh, for the Brunel motion. And of course, I mean, here we have uh, an equality between the two quantities, and, and here this will be somehow an approximation. But all the game is to try to have this approximation and then to work just uh, with the Brunel motion because it, it's much more. Oh, excuse me, I, I don't understand what is this S? to n. I understand, uh, I mean, the rest, but what is S to n? Yeah, so yeah, so this is, uh, so to say, the random walk, which would be associated to my to, to my walk. So, so, uh, so imagine that uh, so we have this picture, and we move like this. So S of n will be just, uh, so let's say we start from 0. And so it will be a sum, in fact, of uh, independent moves. And each move um, belongs to my step set. Okay, so this is a classic. Okay, this I understand, but you 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 multiply probability by, by uh, ah, okay. Th I this mean, I don't understand. Ah, okay, it's so number of of walks of number of something. Yeah, yeah. This is a number of uh, the total number of walks because imagine that uh, you have a uh, uh, four uh, different. Uh, okay, steps. total uh, number of walks uh, yeah. with n steps. Exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. And, okay. And the, which, which ends anywhere, even okay. outside okay. of the. Sure, of the, sure. Yeah, ex sure. Okay, good. Okay, so what I wanted to do now is, is to spend uh, like two minutes on how we can define Brunel motion because I was not, I was not totally sure that uh, it was uh, something uh, unknown by everybody. Um, so, in fact, there is no difficulty to, to define Brunel motion in dimension n if you know how to do it in dimension one, just because we can take independent coordinates. So all the difficulties to, to look at the dimension one. Um, so what I do here is that I, I take um, the plane, so R2. On the horizontal axis, we have the, the time variable. And the, on the vertical axis, we have the space. And I take a simple walk, which can just move uh, up and down. But because of the time representation, it's like a, a directed uh, a walk. So this is one representation of my walk in dimension one. And now what I would like to do is to, to look at this uh, same objects, but from um, very far away. And uh, imagine that we take a scaling um, of this form. So now we will say that here in the time, it will be a, a length equal to one. And in the vertical direction, we will take a square root of n. And the key point is that uh, if now you go to the limits, 
I mean, you go further and further away from the, from the picture. At the end, when n goes to infinity, you are going to see uh, an object which is non-degenerate. I mean, not equal to infinity, not equal to, to zero, so non-degenerate, and which will be the same um, Yeah, so I mean, it's hard to, to make a picture because, of course, the, uh, the path have, have to, to satisfy some properties, but um, uh, this is something which is uh, nowhere differentiable and which has many, many uh, beautiful and interesting properties. Okay, but um, let's say this is okay for, for my talk to, to have uh, this understanding of Brunel motion. This is just a limit of uh, a random work. And of course, something uh, very important is that it is a universal object. If you take a different random works, uh, so here I took just uh, up and down. But imagine now you take another one, like, I don't know, up, and so you can go to the right, down, and I mean, you, you take any kind of step sets. At the end, you will have basically the same object. So this is universal. Okay. And so now I wanted to be a bit more precise about this dic dictionary between discrete and, and continuous settings. And um, to see a bit finally how we are going to compute uh, our number of works, because this is again uh, the objective of uh, this talk. Uh, so, in this picture, you have uh, a seen it already. So, on the left, we have just a path for uh, random work, and on the right, for Brunel motion. So, we have a this is totally uh, analog. And now, um, we have also some analogies between uh, the two worlds. And let's say on the left, we have this number of excursions. So this is what we want to compute. Uh, so again, this is a number of works which have some starting points x, ending points y, have a length equal to n, and are confined to the point. And the analog quantity in the continuous world is called, in fact, it has a name, so, which is a good sign, and it is very well uh, studied. This is the heat kernel uh, of the cone, and what could be, what should be, the equivalent definition. Um, so this is a probability starting from x, so we keep the same uh, starting point, that the Brunel motion at time t is equal to y, or let's say belongs to a small neighborhood of y, and that uh, tau here is bigger than t, I mean, which says that uh, we stayed, we were confined in the cone up to time at t. And um, so I, I will explain in, in a minute uh, that in fact we can compute in a rather explicit way this kind of quantity. So we're happy because we, we have found in the scaling limit that something was computed. So we can do something. Uh, but before, I wanted to mention that also the total number of, of works, uh, which now in fact is the sum of all my, my previous numbers uh, on the ending points. So you sum up all the works, whatever, wherever they uh, terminate, they end in the, in the point. And uh, here's the analogy of this quantity is to look at the survival probability, which is a probability starting from some point X um, to stay in the cone up to time T. Yeah, and, and the main uh, message is that in fact, we can compute uh, these two quantities here. And I'm going to explain it a bit now. So I will not give uh, details because it, it could be a bit more too, a bit complicated. So how to compute uh, the heat scan? Um, so here's the key point is that you can prove that this quantity satisfies some uh, PDEs, so some partial differential equations. And um, maybe the one of the most famous PDEs is the heat equation. And in fact, the heat kernel satisfies the heat equation. So the heat equation is, is this one here. If you take the derivative with respect to the time, and then you subtract by the Laplacian operator, you have zero. And so all in all, finally, if you look not at the discrete random work, but at the Brunel motion, we have a totally a classical object here, which is a solution, which is a heat scanner, so which is a solution to the heat equation. Of course, it's a, a bit complicated because we have a cone, 
And so we also have complicated boundary conditions. So the heat kernel should be zero outside of the cone and so on. So we have many conditions. But still, this is totally identified and uh, studied for a long time. And um, yeah, something we, we can try to do here is to then to solve. So what does it mean solving the heat kernel? Which kind of uh, expression do we have? And this is related to what I wrote in, in yellow, so sorry, to analysis on, uh, on manifold. So I mean, this is again a, a bit a new world, but we, we know how to do it and we have tools to, to, to do it. Okay, so I, I hope the, the, mes the message is somehow clear. So we have an analogy between discrete and continuous, and we exactly know how to, to solve the continuous setting. And all the questions, which, which is complicated, is to show how we can transfer what happens in the continuous setting to the discrete setting. But some people in the community, the probabilistic community, uh, yeah, are doing this kind of uh, research. And so what is the conclusion of this part? Um, so a priori, this part is very well suited for asymptotics. Because once you have this approximation, discrete continuous, we can transfer the results and exactly have um, an asymptotics for the number of flips. So of course, we cannot hope uh, to have an exact expression because if you take the limits, you are going to lose many, a lot of information, so that's clear. But still, what is nice is that we have an equivalence. We have an asymptotics when you take a very, very long uh, walk, we know how many of them we are going to, to, to count. And uh, so in fact, the asymptotics is rather classical. So we have a C, which is um, a universal constant. We have some function here, which is harmonic, but I will not speak about this, which explain a bit how um, this uh, depends on X and Y, which has a beginning and the ending point of the group. Um, we also know how to compute rho to the end. So rho explains how fast my number of folks grows in the exponential regime. And what is maybe the, uh, the nicest of all the quantities, and I'm going to speak a, a bit on it in the last part, is uh, the polynomial correction. So the critical exponent alpha contains also a lot of information. But anyway, so we can just say that uh, if you use uh, this probabilistic approach, you can get uh, asymptotics for the number of And what is a bit surprising is that we also can deduce um, some results about the complexity of the generating function. So here maybe I should be a bit more explicit. So imagine you have you have a series of the from uh, sum of uh, a n to uh, x n. Um, and I, I know you. The question is: Do we have a, a linear differential equation? And the only thing you know about the, the function is that when n goes to infinity, let's say, I know you have a behavior of, of this form, rho to the n and n to the alpha. So you just know how it behaves in the asymptotic regime, but you have no formula for, for, for the series. Yeah, you just have an asymptotic information. And so I, I know how obvious it is for for you. Well, but, what is what is alpha? How alpha is related to the random walk? So, I mean, in what I'm saying just now, a priori, there is no relation at all with the random walk. So this is a general question. And in, in, in oh. two minutes, I will explain uh, how to compute alpha. Ah, OK. And so what I wanted to say here is that, in fact, if you know, I don't know that uh, alpha here is a, a bad number. So bad, I mean, is not a rational number. So let's say it's a square root of two, or I don't know. Then, in fact, you can prove uh, in, in some settings that the functions, the associated uh, generating function, cannot satisfy any uh, linear differential equation. So there is a relation between the complexity of the function and the arithmetic properties of uh, rho and al alpha. And uh, to, to give one example, so please now take a look on the, on the right. So this time I have, again, a new model so with five uh, different steps. And um, if, you, if you apply all, the, all this probabilistic approach, you can compute uh, alpha. So just trust me uh, for now, of the form of pi 
uh, divided by some arc cosine. So arc cosine is a reciprocal function, the cos of function, evaluated, evaluated at uh, I, I have a question. Is, uh, is the series a n x to the n um, the same generating function as usual? I mean, generating function related to the random walk or not? Uh, no, so what I wanted to say is that a priori this question of uh, relating the complexity of any kind of series uh, to the asymptotics is very general. I mean, we, we can ask in, in, in general. But of course, for me, uh, there is always a probability because, behind. You, know, you, you have, uh, you compared ran, uh, Brownian motion and random walk. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this uh, probability, this is, I mean, the number of walks confined to the cone. Ah, okay, but not ended at, at y. Okay, okay. So you obtain this formula with the uh, heat kernel and rho. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so this I, I will explain in the in the five uh, last minutes of my, of okay, my talk. Okay. So a bit how to compute alpha. But okay. just to, to, to finish on this, what I wanted to say is that in general we have this question. So the probabilistic approach uh, gives us a way to compute alpha. And one of the questions we, we like to answer is: Is this uh, quantity uh, a, a rational number or not? And so you, you can try to do it as an exercise. So if you have a pi over r cosine of one divided by four, so how can you prove that this number is a rational or not? I mean, this is a concrete question which appears in, in this field. And yeah, so, so to conclude, but I think I, I will be quick because I, I want to, to finish in, in five minutes to, to stay in the, in the time. I, I wanted to give a few hints about now a relation with, with this combinatorial model and a few questions from analysis and from geometry uh, in, in spectral theory. So it's exactly what Eva uh, asked. So, so now we have this question. We have an asymptotics for the number of walks, which we obtain by approximation uh, with Brownian motion. We have uh, a critical exponent, an exponent alpha. And all the question is, what is this alpha? So if, if we solve this heat kernel, which kind of alpha are we going to, to have? So there is a first uh, easy answer, which says, no problem. There is a formula, which you can read in blue. Uh, so alpha, in fact, will be related to the dimension. So if you're working in dimension two, d is equal to two. So this is the easy parameter. And the most interesting parameter will be uh, this lambda one here and lambda one will be related to some eigenvalue of the problem. So I will explain this. So this is uh, here. So in mind, uh, from the very beginning, you have a, a cone. And um, maybe it's natural to say, OK, uh, I, I, I don't mind a bit what is going on in the cone. I will just see the trace. So what happens on this field? And so, what I want to do now is to, to define a new domain, a D, which by definition is the intersection of the cone uh, with the sphere. So in dimension two, it, it's very simple. So a cone is called a, a wedge, and the, the sphere is a unit circle. So if you take the intersection of the, these two domains, you have a small arc uh, of circle. Yeah? Um, in dimension three, it's a bit more complicated. So we have now the sphere of dimension two embedded in, in R3. And uh, what is the trace of a cone of the cone uh, on this domain? So I know how obvious it is for you, but because for me, I'm not looking at any kind of cones. For me, a cone, it will be uh, typically uh, R plus Q. Okay, or if you want any kind of uh, linear transformation of uh, R plus Q, so what is the trace of this domain on the sphere? And in fact, it defines a nice domain because it defines a, a triangle, a, a spherical triangle, so something like this. Okay. And of course, I mean, and continue in any dimension, we can define this domain. And uh, so how to compute lambda one, this is the first step. We define this uh, intersection domain on the sphere. So it's a bit like if, if you have the walk, you don't want to look at all the random walk. You just want to take uh, to look at the, the projection of the walk on the sphere in the cone. So this is a more complicated uh, model, of course. 
but this is a, a simpler domain, so it's not clear if this is useful. And so how to compute a, a lambda, lambda one. So now we define a, a Dirichlet problem on this uh, domain D. D. Um, so by this, I mean, we want to solve uh, this problem here. So we have um, the Laplace operator evaluated Q should be equal to minus lambda U. So we are looking for eigenvalues, eigenfunctions for this problem. And we call it a Dirichlet, Dirichlet uh, eigenvalue problem because we take a Dirichlet a boundary condition. So U is equal to zero uh, on, the, on the boundary of the, of the domain. So it's, yeah, sorry, it's a bit technical, but uh, this is exactly what, uh, if you solve the heat kernel, it's exactly what is uh, very happening here. And now we, we can use a, a very general theory, which says that we will have a discrete spectrum. And so the lambda one by definition will be the smallest of all these eigenvalues. So yeah, I mean, this is the formula. Maybe I, I can show it again. Um, so we know how to compute alpha in terms of lambda one. Alpha is again this exponent for my problem. And so to have an access to this lambda one, you should be able to solve this Dirichlet uh, eigenvalue problem, which is explicit because we, so we know the code, but of course it becomes complicated. And uh, as, a, as a last slide, so I wanted Excuse me, so I will not speak about this. But I just wanted to say that, unfortunately, even in dimension three, we do not know how to solve this. So what I mean is that if you give me any, any kind of triangle on the sphere, just there is no formula in general uh, for, for on that one. So it means that we cannot say much about uh, the asymptotics, of course, we can say something, but we cannot say, okay, lambda one would be equal to uh, and four or any kind of classical number. So this is a very complicated problem. And even if you have um, nice triangles, I don't know, for example, you, so you, you take on the sphere, you take uh, a very big equilateral triangle of uh, angle two pi over three. So this is a nice triangle. And uh, so I, I know how, how fast you are with ge geometry, but in fact, you can tile uh, the sphere. So we can totally uh, cover the sphere just by using uh, four triangles. So it's, it's rather easy to, to, to see. So we, we, we could think that, okay, this triangle is nice. Uh, we have tiling properties. So maybe we can just have a, an expression for the lambda one. And in fact, nobody is able, as for today, to. to so we can have approximation. We can say, okay, this is about this number just by using classical techniques, but nobody is able to prove uh, if this uh, number is in Q. I mean, it's a rational number. And this question is very natural because in fact, it corresponds to, to this walk. So imagine, so we are in dimension three and you look at this walk, which can move to this direction. So minus one, minus one, minus one, and then uh, three more directions. So this one, this one, and this one. Um, so, I mean, it's difficult to be a, a simpler model, but still for this one, nobody is able to say something about uh, the exponent. So this is a kind of uh, open question that's not we have. And okay, so I think it's time to, to, to thank you all for your attention. And uh, again, if you have any question now or even after by email, uh, I would be happy to, to keep in touch. So thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Maybe from online participants? Are there any questions? Oh, again, yes, I mean, there it, is a question. Okay, yeah. Can you see it? Uh, if uh, yeah. alpha is the spectral gap, is rho some volume? Um, so I, I never thought of this interpretation, but rho in fact is, is maybe a bit simpler as uh, alpha because if you have the step sets, you, um, you can basically compute a rho 
as a, I think it's something like one over. And now imagine that you have a, a, this a quantity, which is, so I'm just writing somehow the kernel here. Every time you have a jump uh, in your step sets S, you, you put it in this polynomial. And then what you want to do is to take the minimization of this on uh, R plus uh, square. So you, so you see, we have this uh, interpretation, which is, uh, of course, not totally obvious because we need to minimize uh, some given function, but still, uh, so yeah, we, we have this and uh, I, I, I would say it's sufficient to, yeah, to, to compute it and uh, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Oh, you will have a look at chat or? Oh, thank you. Okay, okay. So well, we thank you again, and uh, it's you. it's been recorded, so people can uh, watch again, ask questions by mail. I ask a lot yeah. of questions in the meantime, so I'm happy. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye, and I hope to bye. see you in Bethlehem uh, soon. Yeah, uh, maybe in in um, in in the spring. Yeah, okay? sure. At yeah, direct conference. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you.